So, good evening. I am Jose Marie Cartena, and this is my paper, Investigating the Online Protest, No Students Left Behind, an Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis of Allied Student Protesters' Views on Online Distance Learning During the COVID-19 Pandemic. As we all know, we have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in our own personal ways. The economy sunk, health uh, systems were ravaged, and the educational system was flipped on its head during this pandemic. And the pandemic, sadly, forced teachers to suddenly resort to online teaching. Educators are now in dire need of training and instructional coaching due to being simply required to teach online. I'm pretty sure that many of the teachers who are listening right now feel this. And faculty members are not alone in experiencing issues in the online educational environment. Students, likewise, have a myriad of concerns. And some of the concerns include faculty communication and readiness. They don't feel like the faculty members are ready in terms of teaching online, which is not surprising since we were all forced to go online. And another thing is students' readiness. If, uh, the students feel like they are not ready to learn online as well. And in the business education, we, all, we actually have a concept for the students. We measure the students' uh, readiness to be students in a, dis in a distance education setting. Uh, students are likewise experiencing a lot of mental health issues surrounding the online learning environment. Uh, it's because of the COVID stress, and because of the extreme isolation some of them are experiencing, and it affects their online learning as well. And because of the pandemic, a lot of students are experiencing financial issues which affect their learning and educational experience. Besides those uh, concerns, there are technological concerns for, uh, surrounding online learning. Number one is inconsistency of the internet connection and learning services. I'm pretty sure a lot of people know in the Philippines especially that our internet connection here in the Philippines is not that reliable. And some of the uh, learning management systems in the Philippines, uh, even though they were made abroad, uh, are not perfect. Sometimes they experience bugs, sometimes they experience glitches. Uh, however, these concerns surrounding uh, ITCs, I mean ICTs, uh, only concern to those who in, uh, individuals who actually have access to these technologies. Some don't even have access to the hardware and resources at all. So this uh, divide is actually called the digital, digital divide. Uh, the digital divide refers to the different difference regarding access to computers, internet connectivity, and even computer literacy. Uh, some people have computers, some don't. Some people have really good internet connection. Some people right now are actually still using uh, DSL. Um, some students regarding computer literacy don't know how to use computers at all, and some students really know how to use computers in a lot of for a lot of work, a lot of fields, a lot of study. Um, it also refers to the nature of usage. Some students, uh, some individuals, only use the computer for gaming, for entertainment, and some students even don't know how to use uh, the computer to work or learn. So that's the usage uh, gap. So potential effects of the digital, digital divide uh, range from uh, having less experience, meaning they potentially affect uh, the student's grades when they use ICTs. Uh, when they answer quizzes, answer assessments, because they don't know how to manipulate uh, the computer environment to better suit their needs or answering the quizzes. Another thing is some students who have less experience in using the IC in ICTs may have less confidence when doing uh, their educational tasks, which will lead to lower grades or lower uh, self-efficacies in their assessments or in their educational practice. Another thing is um, most obviously, because students who don't have any access at all would not have any access to their classes or their materials. So some quick facts regarding the digital divide in the Philippines. One, majority of the households in the Philippines don't actually have any shared computers. They don't have any computers at all. And a really small percentage of the households in the Philippines actually have internet access, only 17.7%. And according to Batikolon et al., students were, are not skilled in using ICTs for education. Because uh, when we say ICTs, uh, students only usually use them for games, mobile phones for uh, mobile games, computers for online games, etc. Uh, internet issues, we, all, we have all experienced this, and it's really hard for students to co concentrate and work on their materials when uh, they get con constantly disconnected. Number four, um, the digital divide actually has uh, implications on the mental health of students, as seen by Cleopas and Roger 2021. Um, students who have less access actually have uh, higher COVID-19 anxiety. So for a more comprehensive review, please uh, see Panganiban 2018. So needless to say, the digital divide in the Philippines is severe. So um, in connection with the online classes and in connection with the digital divide, the online protest no student left behind 
um, group. So the No Student Left Behind was basically an online protest which a lot of organizations and a lot of uh, famous people called for the suspension of the online classes within uh, during the pandemic. So here we have a post from the Rise of for Education and Alliance, League of Filipino Students, Students' Rights and Welfare Philippines, and the NUSP, all calling for uh, the stop uh, stop uh, the, the halting of online classes. So online protests such as these can be considered what Bennett and Silverberg call connective action. We're used to calling protest as collective action, but when it goes online, connective action is, is the term we use it. Uh, we use uh, to refer to these uh, social uh, actions. Uh, the collective action transcends into the digital world. So some people might say that these, this is actually lazy. This is actually something that um, is less than a collective action in the streets. But however, um, they explain that through the utilization of ICT and social media, protests become personalized as individuals are able to express their own personal views and meanings towards the issues that are expressed. As opposed to traditional, traditional collective action wherein the content of the movement is framed collectively or by an organization. So here we see the democratization of the, uh, the social movement. Individuals are already able to express individually uh, their concerns and their meanings through mostly social media. Okay? So in the context of connective activism, meanings towards social issues are constructed by individuals through consumption of both the traditional and social media. And, these, uh, and express these meanings to their own social media accounts. And the process of engaging in discourse in online activism in itself can be associated with variety of meaning. So um, you notice here that I say uh, the word meaning a lot. So that's because um, I'm interested in looking for the meaning behind the No Student Left Behind. In particular, this paper wishes to investigate the meanings of the protesters behind No Student Left Behind associated, associated with the events relevant to their cause. Uh, this will uncover uh, the meanings behind student activism, online protests, the digital divide, and also provide insight into how uh, to address the concerns of the protesters as well. Okay, so this is a really big slide. I'm sorry. I'm just going to read some of the salient points. So my methodology is the interpretative phenomenological analysis. We focus here in the meaning-making process and the meanings associated with a certain phenomena. Okay, this is because even though we all experience something the same way, we interpret these things differently. The same thing of going on, uh, going into a car may be uh, different in terms of the interpretation depending on the individual. A rich person might consider going into a car a really regular thing, a day-to-day -day thing, while a poor person might interpret going into a car as an extreme luxury. Okay? Uh, previous studies have utilized IPA, for example. In one study, they explored the meanings uh, rebels associated with their use of armed conflict. Okay. And another uh, study in terms of feminism, um, the personal meanings participants had associated with sexism were explored. So uh, in terms of collective actions, meanings were seen as a crucial factor as to why participants joined the movement. So um, when we look into uh, the inside of a, connect, a collective action, and in this case, a connective action, the meanings behind these, um, uh, the, these motives of joining is actually the crux of the uh, investigation. Okay. So sampling, purposive sampling was used to find individuals on social media. I looked for hashtag no student left behind and I messaged them uh, through Twitter and or Facebook and asked them if they could join. Um, they invited to join the study and uh, uh, once they joined the study, I asked them if they knew any others who would like to join. This is snowball sampling. Participants were all enrolled in private colleges in the Philippines. Uh, I did not uh, record and or um, report age, sex, and schools of the participants as this may... Uh, uh, increase their risk uh, since, especially if the if reporting their schools. And recruitment uh, was halted when data saturation was deemed established, leading to five participants in total. So data privacy and consent forms were given via Google uh, Google Forms. The inter interview schedule was composed of questions that circulated around the primary research question, and the interviews were conducted via voice call due to limitations brought upon by the quarantines. The subsequent analysis was undertaken uh, following the guidelines set forth by Smith et al. 1999, and validation was data, uh, of the data was done via member validation. So, results. First category is the financial issues amplify technical issues. Um, category 1 um, basically says that um, they were. It felt that the online classes, that the uh, the online distance distance learning setup, just basically showed how much uh, education was for the privileged, especially during the pandemic. Um, 
implementing these technologies has only exacerbated the gap and promoted elitism in the educational system, exactly how Sims et al. Um, predicted it would. So uh, some data strands. In all honesty, ICT itself is a privilege, and we look at the Philippines as a society that isn't really open to equality. That's according to one participant. Another participant said that, but we still have students from public schools, those who can't afford those gadgets, who don't have much ICT skills, and they, might, may, they may not even have any. And those in the middle and upper classes were able to gain necessary skills before. But what about the marginalized, those in the fringes of society who didn't have any access even before? So here that they really saw that the uh, engagement of online learning was um, part of being privileged. And they wanted to talk about and they wanted to bring about the concerns surrounding individuals who can't access online learning the same in the same level and the same quality as they did. So um, the ca second category basically says that the schools and the government ignored the students. So uh, it, while it may not be the case that the schools and the government um, uh, really ignored the students, the participants, is the important thing here is that they felt that they were ignored, that they um, interpreted the actions of the schools and the government to be ignoring their complaints. Implications of this interpretation could be grave as ignoring the complaints of protesters are also in interpreted as a form of betrayal and insult, according to Ward and Ostrom. So uh, some data stands here include, there was this town hall meeting wherein we talked about the academic freeze. I don't want to name drop, but one of the faculty members response was like, you're just students, you're not the ones in charge. So that's a really um, uh, heavy data strand from uh, the participant. And another participant said, and you would hear in the town hall me meeting in consultation with the administrators, they would say, you're just a noisy minority. It feels like they're invalidating the things their students are going to. They're the ones who they're supposed to be listening to. They're the one of the biggest stakeholders in the university. Okay. And lastly, uh, the category uh, third, uh, the category three, being an ally of those in need. Uh, allies are individuals who strive to end oppression through supporting and advocating on behalf of the oppressed. So uh, basically, ally, the concept of ally started with the LGBT uh, movement because um, individuals who felt empathy towards LGBT individuals uh, who are actually straight wanted to fight for the rights and um, the equal rights uh, the LGBT individuals deserve. So these individuals who were straight were called allies. And uh, the concept of allies um, grew uh, going into for example, Caucasian individuals or white, white individuals fighting for individuals who were African-Americans or Black people. And uh, in the context of white people uh, joining uh, Black Lives Matter protests, etc. And what uh, this category reveals is that uh, the hidden path of the protests um, is basically showing that participants are not, for in, for, uh, not in for it for themselves. They basically joined the protest to fight for those who were underprivileged, who could not experience any uh, the education because of the digital divide they were experiencing. So some, uh, some data strands include, because no student left behind is not for people like me, but it's for people that cannot, the people who can push forward with online classes. Another one is, when you complain, it doesn't mean that you're the only one who's experiencing the problem. Even if I had access to technology, I joined no student left behind because I see my batchmates and other students struggling. So there. So um, with all that, some conclusions. Ultimately, it can be said that allies, no student left behind, was powered by the participants' need to bring their less privileged co-students' concerns to the forefront, forefront when they were first ignored. Uh, a lot of people who do not have access in uh, the ICTs can't actually join uh, no student left behind online because how could they? They can't, they can't connect to the internet that much compared to those who have. They can uh, be more visible in, on Twitter or on Facebook as much as they could expressing their concerns. And then another thing is, um, this study adds to the go go ongoing debate as to whether or not technology it promotes or hinders educational equality. So we used to think that educational um, ICTs would promote educational equality. However, um, the digital divide shows a dark truth about the non-neutrality of technology. Um, while it can help the educational process, it makes underprivileged students more into uh, it puts underprivileged students more into a disadvantaged position, as you can see right now. Uh, students who don't have the privilege of having uh, good computers or good internet connections can't actually go to their online classes or access these online classes well. And uh, as, as for policy recommendations, the author suggests to those who have the authority to continue online classes to provide alternative methods of distance delivery to, of education, such as SMS, modular de delivery based on paper, or asynchronous uh, activities. So finally, what I have to say is that we must also listen to the primary stakeholders of our schools, the students. So acknowledgement, I would like to thank Dr. Jean Saludades of the UP Open University, Dr. Irene Delenia, I'm Mir, and the reviewers for their comments and suggestions regarding this paper.
Thank you very much.